Today we are going to take a deep dive into cascading style sheets. Cascading style sheets. When we started the, the quarter out, we said that every time you fetch a website, you bring across the HTML file. The HTML file contains the structure and the semantics, the content of the, of the web page. And then the style sheet, the .css file, contains all the style information, the font, the colors, the white space, the positioning, all of that information. And then any behaviors that are happening on the client side occur in the JavaScript file. Next week and the following week, we're going to deal with JavaScript, just like it. Today is our last look at cascading style sheets. We're going to go fairly deep. There's a handout up here, and because this is new material, it's just on paper, I'll have this up in D2L here. You'll notice that some of this stuff is going to be uh, review. Some of this stuff we've already covered and you've already been doing in your assignments. Some of this stuff is required for you to get a good grade on your current assignment. Very good. Here is a uh, useful piece of information for you. Uh, some of this stuff will be on the quiz. Some of this stuff will be useful if you choose to do the extra credit assignment, one of the two extra credit assignments at the end. So that's useful to you too. And some of this stuff isn't really necessary for you to do either the assignments or the quiz. I know I should probably do not say that to you. Because that was um, but this is, this is how cascading style sheets work. And if you go into web development, seeing this thing three or four times will help you get it into your skull. This is an introductory class, so this is your introduction to it. But there are some folks here who have seen this stuff before, so I want to make sure we go into it in enough depth that we give them something of value as well. Excuse me now. Yes, sir. Um, when you say it'll be on the quiz, you mean there's no quiz this week. You're talking about the quiz next week? The final. The final, yeah. So the final will have uh, questions in it about um, cascading style sheets. There's um, three things Internal, internal or in line. Then I want to talk about the cascade itself. Why they call them why they call them cascade style sheets. Frankly, this is tough. This is difficult to understand. I don't know about you, but it's I've been doing this for years and it's still difficult for me to understand. So we're going to take a running leap at this brick wall, and we're going to see how it sticks. And uh, if you're inter this, interested in this sort of thing, you'll hit this over and over again. You already know how styles work. If you have worked in Microsoft Word before, you have used both styles and style sheets. The nice thing about Microsoft Word is it has cute little dialog boxes and help up in here help you understand how the styles work. Hi. So for example, if you want to style this paragraph, it brings up a dialog box and it says here are all the parameters you can do with a paragraph. You can change the alignment, left, right, center, you can change indentation, all that kind of stuff. Similarly, you can modify the font, choose a font family, choose a font style, choose a font size, and the various effects. This is typical of any WYSIWYG design program. WYSIWYG stands for what you see is what you get. In this class, we like to deal with the code. We like to deal with the underlying code. This is, we want to know how it works. Two reasons. One is that gives you the most control. 
And second, thank you, it allows you to both understand the thing in depth and demonstrate to me that you understand the thing in depth. What you'll see when we switch from this kind of support, this kind of graphical user interface, to our style sheets, is you switch from lots of help with lots of information and big words that everybody understands and that are translated into your native language. And you'll switch from that into um, something that looks, well, it looks exactly like code because that's what it is. So if we look at If we look at the style in cascading style sheets, it looks like code. It is tightly abbreviated. So this looks like an HTML element. It is. It's a tag. This is a tag. This is lucky for us. They're actually using words here. But here they're using a, a hex triple for the R, G, and D. So it's the same sort of thing you run into when you're coding anything. You read what you've got here, and you have to kind of translate that into what that means. It's not as easy to do as with um, something like this. But it's a skill everybody can learn. It's a skill everybody can learn. So let's break this down and take a look at these rules so that you can begin to understand how they're all put together. Okay, then we'll come back around, we'll take a look at this particular example here, we'll play with it a little bit. We'll use Firebug to show how you can debug cascading style sheets. And uh, by the end of today, you'll have the ability to completely control your web pages style in a number of different ways. You've already been doing that. Let's make sure I've got Firebug downloaded before I leave that alone. Now, enter. Let's start now. This material, especially this material, comes from W3 schools. declarations say that this property has this value. The color of this element is blue. The property is separated from the value by a colon. The whole declaration is terminated by a semicolon. These are statements. You see this in programming all the time. Especially older languages, they always have a semicolon at the end of them. We ignore white space. You can have a space here, you could have a character term. White space is the name of a class of characters that are invisible. Character terms, line feeds, uh, space characters are the most common form of white space. And it doesn't matter. By convention, you'll tend to see people that um, don't put any white space around the columns. Sometimes you'll see them where they do. This is another situation where you walk into a shop and they'll tell you how to do their style. The other thing you'll see 
is that a lot of times people will put these declarations in alphabetical order. Now, every rule doesn't have to have every property. There are probably a hundred different properties that you can set with the CSS3. And then when you add in the browser specific stuff, there's probably 150, 200. You don't use all of those all the time. Typically, you only use the ones that you want to change for this particular element. This is, for example, a header level one element. And you're saying, I want a blue, I want blue font, and I want it to be 12. PX stands for pixels. There are other units of measures. EM stands for M's. Anyone know what an M is? No. It's a, yes. It's a fixed amount of space. Yeah, it's the size of a lowercase m. In that font size, if you want to say, this is M, I, I want my heading to be 2M, that means the heading is twice the size of the rest of the text. If you want, as you see on most pages, you want to see your text a little smaller, you say your size is 0.8M, spelled E-M. This is pixel. Pixels are what's actually displayed on the screen. Now, on, uh, on this screen, Typically, how many pixels per inch are there on a typical LCD? Anyone know? It's about 72 pixels per inch. 72 pixels per inch. It's different on different displays. On, uh, on some newer phones, it's 120 pixels per inch. So a normal <coughs> display. So when you're using pixels, you're specifying how big things are relative to the, the page, but how they actually show up to your customer's eyeballs is going to change. Also, if you say it's going to be so many pixels big, if they do something like uh, you know, control plus or control minus, your definition of pixels is out the window. These days, you see a lot of people using pixel measurements. So you might as well just stick with that. So that's the typical rule. It's really not much more complicated than that. The thing that happens when you read a complicated style sheet is just, there's just a lot of it. And it, it's visually noisy. There's a lot of stuff going on as you read through it, and it's hard for you to figure out what should I pay attention to. But look for the selectors, look for the uh, brackets, try and make these things in alphabetical order, then it'll become easier to scan. Spend some special time on selectors. Now the first one, like you see here, is an element identifier. So that's the same thing as a tag, so like body or paragraph P for Paragraph H1, header level 1. That's the exact same thing you would see in HTML. The neat thing about it is that it nests the same way that your HTML tags do. So remember, inside of HTML tags, we have head, we have body. Inside of a body, we have things like, oh, a table tag. It's a container. It contains rows. Inside those rows, they have paragraphs. Excuse me. There's a structure. There's a hierarchical structure to an HTML document. You can use exactly that same document object model structure here. Now what's really cool about that is you can say, well, I want the stuff, I want the text inside my tables to be smaller than normal. Normally, if you look at a well-structured document, the stuff inside of tables is a little smaller. Well, oftentimes, they'll use a compressed font so it's, you can fit more stuff in. You expect people to spend a little more time to read the stuff in the table, so you typically make this, the font a little smaller, a little more compact. In your style sheet, because we can, we can specify multiple selectors on one rule, you can say that very easily, very succinctly. So as an example,
So if we look at the source code for this, Firebug, open Firebug, web developer, Firebug, I want to put, it's going to be hard for you to read this in the summary, but um, <coughs> Inside, I don't know if you can read this, inside this HTML file, I've got a style sheet. This is how your assignments look now. This is how your journals look now. Here, I want to say my paragraphs are blue. Inside a list, L-I, my paragraphs are red. And so you can see here, up here, oh, my paragraph's not blue. Something else is going on. We'll get to that in a minute. But inside my lists, the paragraphs are red. So what I've done here is I've used a selector that knows about the structure of my document. That's another reason why you want to make sure the HTML that you use reflects the structure of your document. You don't use the HTML document object model for styling at all. You use it by saying, well, I've got a list, and inside a list I've got a bunch of paragraphs. And that's all you care about. You don't care how big they are or their font. Just worry about what they are. The other kind of selector that we've again seen here is you can name elements inside an HTML document. You can give them a class name or you can give them an ID. As you know, the difference between classes, I can have many things on the same page with the same class name. I can only have one of each kind of ID. We're going from general to specific here. The most general thing is, I've got paragraphs. The next most general thing, the more specific thing rather, is I've got paragraphs, but they're, oh, I don't know, my pull quotes. And then the most specific thing is that particular paragraph. I want to have this style. Finally, the last type of selector is a pseudo selector. What was the example of our pseudo selector that we used? Anyway. Remember how you made that image opaque? And what? It was so long ago. Hover. It's like a dream. Hover. Hover. Right. So that's a selector that only becomes active while the browser is processing your image. Or while you're actually using the page. So if you visited a link, it suddenly has a, has a pseudo selector on it as, as having been visited. This is how you turn visited links into this is how you make things highlight when you hover over them. We're going to take a break in just a second. I don't want to go through all of the various properties that you can put in a rule. There's too many of them. But I want to call your attention to three of those particular properties. And those are the ones that control the box model. Everything you see on a page, everything you see on an HTML page is a box. And most of the time we don't draw the borders around those boxes so you don't see them. And in fact, really good designers do fun things with the background images of elements so that they look like they're, they're curved or they look like they have, oh, I don't know, um, fuzzy edges and that sort of thing. But it's a real common form of an HTML page, very common to see a banner across the top. And most often we'll see some sort of logo here. These are, these are style conventions. Oftentimes you'll see some sort of navigation column on the left. So there's some sort of nav here. And then in here, there are boxes. You don't see those boxes but the page designer built those boxes. These nets. So the first box is body. Inside of body, I'll have another box that comes here. Inside that box, on the left, I'll have a box that's here. I'll have a box on the right. Sometimes you actually say, put this box, this place on the page, but more often, you just say, this one's first, and then here's another one, it floats to the left, Here's another one, it floats to the right. That way, as I mess with the page, as I move the browser around, the 
the boxes rearrange themselves in a way that makes a lot of sense. Another thing you'll notice, if you view this page in a phone where the screen is very, very, very narrow, a really cool design process they call now is called adaptive design. And this has just come out in the last couple of years. The same boxes are used. The web page doesn't change. The style sheet does. And so in a phone, you know, your phone may only be this big and the screen is only this big. The web page looks like this. And these boxes arrange themselves in a stack and you scroll through them, these boxes here. They just turn off the logo in the banner because you don't want to see that stuff on your phone. You don't have enough real estate for that. And you don't need the nav because you're not, you've got a whole different nav thing. But these content boxes say A, B, C, D, they are exactly the same content. They're exactly the same boxes. They're just stacking different. Bottom line here is that HTML elements all have boxes. 